Radio. <laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. <laughs> Are you a pet parent who's confused about what's best to feed your dog or cat? If you answered yes, you're not alone. It's one of the most common concerns that comes up. Not only is there so much information online, but much of it is conflicting. So who do you believe? What do you believe? And what's right for your animal? And is what might be best too complicated and expensive to feed? Because these questions are so common, I decided to invite onto the show today a pet parent like you, whose journey to find optimum health for her animals led her to a great diet for them. She's going to share with us that journey, what she feeds, what nutrients she's found to be really important for optimal health, and from from her own research, and the results that she's achieved with her pets, and how it's much easier than you might think to do. Her name is Cabernet Lazarus Gavin, and we're going to meet her in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a short break from our sponsor. This is Jody L. Teich, and you're listening to The Hound Healer on Pet Life Radio. So grab that healthy beverage, get comfortable, and we'll be right back. <music> How many of you have pets? My hand's raised. Now think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life. And that pet is lucky to have you too. But unfortunately, there are countless pets out there that don't have a home to call their own. However, Bob's from Skechers is trying to change that. So we developed Bob's for dogs and cats to help pets in need. With every purchase of adorable Bob's footwear or fun, stylish apparel, or even the cutest Bob's pet accessories, Skechers makes a donation to Petco Love to help save shelter pets. And with your help, we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and raised over $7 million. So while you're getting style and comfort with features like Skechers' famous memory foam cushioning, you're also helping to save an adorable pet in need and helping another lucky owner be connected with a future best friend and companion because happiness is having a loving pet by your side. Find Bob's at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, select pet co-locations, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Jody Teich on The Hound Healer on Pet Life Radio. Let's meet Cabernet Lazarus Gavin. She's a pet parent just like you and me, who's found a great diet for her pack. Hey, Cabernet. Hello. How are you today? I'm doing just fine. I'm very, very happy to be here and get to talk to you. I'm so happy that you took time to do my show. I appreciate it. And I'm sure pet parents listening today will appreciate the information that they're going to get to. So let's dive right in. I mean, you are like us. We're all part of this tribe of pet parents. And you started off, as most of us did, uneducated about nutrition and probably doing the best you could with what you knew and the resources you had, right? There were bags and they said dog food. (laughs) So I believed them. Okay. (laughs) So yeah, I I did. And I believed them and um, and I, I tried to get the best kibble I could and everything gave my dog diarrhea. Wow. So is this one of the impetuses that led you to start on this journey? Like what changed for you? Well, you know, I had that experience. She was very, very thin, which concerned me. Now it doesn't concern me, but at the time it did. She didn't look like the other dogs at the dog park who were, frankly, most of them are overweight. And she was actually a really great uh, size, but I didn't know that. I just knew feed this stuff and and your dog's supposed to be fine, which is really interesting because I myself don't go to fast food restaurants and I eat very healthy. And so you'd think it'd be a very quick and easy gear shift, but it's not because if you're not doing what's in the bag, what then? So I had a friend who said to me, well, you know, I think she was going to, I think we went to the park together her and her dogs and me and my dog and and um and she wanted to swing by and pick up some pre-made raw and she said you know there's a whole 
movement out there, a movement about people who think that dogs should be fed raw, whole food, home prepared. I'd never heard of such a thing. And as we often do when we hear something brand new, my brain said, and you will not be a part of that movement. (laughs) Here I am. And uh, I think what she ended up doing was she ended up putting a big old wad of ground food into my dog's mouth and her eyes got enormous. She was like, what was that? So that was, (laughs) right. That was the first inkling. I lived in San Francisco where the wonderful Casey Maxwell, she wasn't married then. So she was just Casey Maxwell back then. And she had just started SFRA, which was a buying company at the time, buying club. And I started reading and she has Danes and her Danes were living twice as long as everybody else's Danes, twice as long as the breed average. Wow. So the breed average, what is that? Like nine years old or something? Six years old. Oh my God. Wow. Six. And hers were living 12. Oh, wow. And they weren't just living 12. They looked beautiful. They, they were, were robust. Yeah. They weren't, you know, they weren't like creaking along. So was this like your first big idea? Like this stumbling across SF Raw and Casey. Casey? Casey. Yeah. Was this like the first big idea? For you that started to really change things. Well, and why I started doing that as opposed to the pre-made raw that my friend was picking up was it was really expensive. The pre-made. The pre-made was really expensive. Mm -hmm. It still is. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, let's see what's out there. Can I do better? Can I do cheaper? Can I do cheaper? Can I do better? Mm -hmm. Yes. And there was definitely a bit of a, what do they call that? A learning curve. Mm-hmm. And, and, but I, I did it. I was like, I, when I heard twice as long, my response was sign me up. <laughs> sure, right. That's what we all want. That's what we all want. Right. We yeah. get these little buddies cause we adore them and we want them to be happy and healthy. And it's our job yeah. as best as we can do to have them happy and healthy. They didn't come and ask to live with us. We went and we got them, whether at a rescue yay rescue, or a responsible breeder or an irresponsible breeder or whatever, we got them in most cases. Yes. Took them into our care and they can't, they can't tell us if what they're eating is not making them feel good. Not with words. And it takes a little while to learn what those other things are. And, And oftentimes it's, they end up in really bad disease and, and it, takes a lot, but it can be done to bring them back from the brink. And um, well, you said something to me in one of our conversations, because, you know, I, I've taken this journey too with my animals over the years and learned from like you, my own eyes, as well as the, the research and other, you know, empirical data from people with their dogs that feeding raw just makes a huge difference. But you said something to me that I definitely want to sort of unpack a little bit. When we talked, you said, Jody, dogs are carnivores, hunters, scavengers, and poop eaters. And I tell my clients and my students that while we've domesticated dogs, you know, over the centuries, what does that really mean? Yes, they come and live in our house with us now. They have cozy, comfy beds, or maybe they have cozy, comfy beds, and they sleep in our beds next to us. We treat them like our children, but have their digestive systems changed all that much? And the the answer is no. So (laughs) they're more inflamed about this. Yeah. And the significance of all this in diet choices. What have you learned? Yes. So what I've learned is it's very, it's interesting. And Dr. Billinghurst, Ian Billinghurst, who wrote, give your dog a bone, talks about evolutionary diet and how, while we have been with dogs for thousands of years, they have not really eaten our food the same way for the last hundred and some change years. So hundred and some change years in evolutionary time is a blip bit in the bucket. Yes. It's nothing. And when you start feeding them in a way that is honoring where they came from and how they're supposed to eat and what their DNA recognizes, they blossom. Mm -hmm. They just blossom. 
Mm-hmm. I see it all the time. I have people that um, have reached out and asked me if I could help them make the switch and I help them make the switch. And I get pictures of these beautiful animals that have slimmed down and are silky and are lithe. And a lot of th- times I hear, oh, you know, she's she's five. She's getting old. She can't jump. She can't jump up into the van. At five. At five. And I was like, you know, and they say she's a senior. And I really hate she's a senior. Is the senior's threshold getting lower and lower and lower? And of course, it depends on a few things and breed and stuff like that. But yeah. this dog was certainly no senior at five, although she was acting like one. And we made the switch to raw and she slimmed down and she's a little pogo stick. Oh, that's lovely. And she looks great and she jumps into the van and jumps out of the van and runs after the ball and goes into the ocean. And she's a little dynamo as her age, she should be. Yes, agreed. What happened with your dog when you made the switch? What did you notice around a dog that you see every day, you know better than anyone? What did you see? Interesting because I had her and I also boarded an Anatolian Shepherd. So my dog was a Border Collie mix. I never did the DNA. I always decided to put the money into food instead of the DNA test. It's a personal choice. My guess was she was a Border Whippet Collie, a Border Collie Whippet Lab. That was my guess. She was 40 okay. pounds and she did not have an ounce extra on her. She was a little skinny mini bullet. And what I noticed was first off, She liked food, period, but she really liked this food. And her coat was so soft and shiny. It was just shiny, shiny, shiny. At the same time, I was boarding the Anatolian Shepherd. So when she stayed with me, we would give her turkey necks and things like she was 80 pounds. She's like, yeah, I'll have a turkey neck. And she didn't care about food. She was like, she was free fed, big old thing of kibble. She was like, "Mm -hmm." she looked bored when she ate it. When I pulled out those turkey necks, she was at attention and lively and so keen to tuck in and eat that. And I gave her some other things too, probably chicken bags, but she just really, really thrived and loved the food that she got. So that was really nice. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, I mean, they, they tell us, they choose what they want. They know what they want. Their bodies know what, what they need. So, yeah, I think that's great to hear. Yeah. It's in their DNA. It's, it, you know what I mean? It's, it's actually programmed in there. My guys are telling us that they want something. Excuse me, Sophie. Sorry, Cabernet. Like my DNA would really like some, some nice meat right now. Um, right. So, right. <laughs> you know, the other thing that happens is when you feed raw meaty bones, which is something that I'm a really big fan of feeding. And I know we'll go into that in detail, but it's a workout. It's not just like getting a bowl of food that they inhale and 10 seconds later, mealtime is over. This replicates closer to what's going to happen in nature. They're going to pull it apart. They're going to tear at it. They're going to use their whole body, their whole back end, all of that stuff. So, so, you know, we're at the gym doing Pilates, trying to get a good core, right? Give your dog a raw meaty bone. That's all the Pilates they need, right? That is super (laughs) helpful. Yes. Yes. I want to dive into all of this. I want to dive into busting some myths about food um, that I think it would be really useful for pet parents to know. And definitely want to talk about what you feed, how you source, what is the best form of probiotics and what meats and fish need to be frozen and for how long before serving and why. So we're going to get into all of this, but we're going to take a quick break from our sponsor. So refresh that healthy beverage, get cozy, and we'll be right back. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. 
For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Welcome back. You're listening to The Hound Healer, and this is Jody Teich on Pet Life Radio. And we're here today with Cabernet Lazarus Gavin, who is a pet parent like us, who's learned a lot about nutrition because she sought out the knowledge, trying to do the best she could do for her babies. And she's going to share some of it with us so that you can understand that it doesn't have to be difficult to feed a great diet. It doesn't have to be very expensive to feed a great diet. So Cabernet, there are some myths about food that are very prevalent in the marketing machine that is the, you know, big pet food industry that I think pet parents need to know the truth about. I'd like us to bust some of those myths right now. So one is the complete and balanced meals that is constantly being, you know, drummed into us beaten us over the head with that it's critical that every meal is a complete and balanced meal. And this is a, it's not really possible. And oftentimes when we talked about this in the commercial foods and even some commercial raw foods that talk about complete meals, they put other stuff in there that we may not want. Um, but talk about that a bit, the complete and balanced meals myth. It is it has nothing to do with nature, just nothing. It's not how nature does its thing, right? So I know they live with us, and I know this is a hard jump for people to make, but there are plenty of wild dogs or homeless dogs who live on the streets or in the outback in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing is they have, there are studies, it's in Dr. Connor's book, there are studies in Australia they get too many wild dogs and they have to cull them, which is very sad. And, but when they do that, they check their stomachs. And first thing is there's no more than like three to 5% vegetation in the stomach. That's Think about that. that. Yep. Yep. Three yep. to 5% vegetation and no more. And so mostly the way they're getting their vegetation is they're taking down small animals or they're scavenging small animals and they're eating the intestines and whatever's in there. And larger animal ruminants, you know, they have the stomachs and, and uh, so they're getting, they're going for that and getting that. And that is what is giving them their vegetables. So they don't need a ton of vegetables and they don't have amylase in their saliva. To so, break down the cellulose. Which breaks down the vegetable. cellulose walls to make it more digestible. So you can cook it, but you're going to lose a lot of nutrients you can pulverize it. You're getting somewhere. Now it's closer to what's going to be in a stomach lining of a ruminant, or you can feed green tripe, which I know we'll go into further. We will. <laughs> so I'm just going to put it out there. So that is one myth. Another myth that I hear a lot is, oh, bones cause constipation. And we're going to really go into bones because it's its own chapter. But it doesn't cause constipation. Um, it does tighten up the stool. And it does, as it goes through, if it's a little hard for them to pass, that's okay. That's actually massaging. Good so you don't, you don't have to get their anal glands expressed. Because yeah. Because it's doing it like nature intended. Yeah. The dogs historically were not taken to a vet to have anal glands expressed, you know, what they ate kept their anal glands clear because of things just like that. I know when I've given my dogs raw meaty bones that they will go poop and it will be harder. And it's like a whisk broom through the colon, which is wonderful. So animals in the nature, the dogs would go out and they would either kill something often small if something was already killed, they were not above going and taking what they could from it. And if it was rotty, that's just fine. They thought nice seasoning. They would eat some poop. They would probably eat some clay. Then the other thing that they would do is they wouldn't always get a meal. 
And that's okay. That's how they're designed. They're designed that they don't always have to get a meal. So I know that's a big controversy and people freak out and anthropomorphize about that, but it is okay for them to skip meals on occasion, especially if they don't feel good. That's the first thing I do. You don't feel good in my house. We're going to fast you. Absolutely. I tell my, my clients the same thing. Yep. So this idea of complete and balanced is a selling tactic. And sadly, veterinarians, unless they have reached beyond really conventional medicine, they don't learn about nutrition in vet school. What they learn about is if you're, if an animal has this disease, you give them this bag of food. If they have this disease, you give them this bag of food. They might understand a little bit of why you're doing that bag as opposed to this bag, but usually the bag will say renal failure formula or something to that effect. And people love to also add as many supplements in. And I do realize that soil is eroded in a lot of areas and we don't have the same nutrition that we've had. But first, my approach is first feed them correctly. First, feed them a species-appropriate diet and see what clears up. Amazing things happen when you do this. Extra weight falls off. Their fur completely changes. So I have a little guy here. Can I show you? Please do. I, I caught a glimpse. This is Blueberry. Oh, I wish everyone could see Blueberry on the podcast. Blueberry is a an adorable chihuahua. He is. He's 14 years old. And while he's really mellow right now, it's because it's the middle of the day. But trust, <laughs> when he's ready to go for a walk or get fed or something pl- wants to play, he is in action. And his fur is dreamy. It is so oh. soft. You want to go down? Go on down. Mommy, it is like- put me down. Now, <laughs> when I got him, he felt like a Brillo pad. Oh, wow. How many years ago was that? We got him about... 11 or 12 years ago. Okay. So he was fairly young dog. He was young. And, uh, and he had, we got him from the SPCA for my mom. And the day we went to see him the first time he was getting neutered. So he got neutered and he got all of the vaccines and then he was given to my mom and my mom didn't feed him very well. And I would make the food and she would say, he doesn't really like it. And then come to find out she's feeding him ice cream and I won't eat my food if the option is ice cream. Are you kidding? So yeah, I'm a fan. I get it, (laughs) but not okay. So when he came, my mother went into a place where she couldn't take him. So the first thing I did was fast him for two days. And he rarely has turned his nose up at food ever since. Ever since. Yeah. He has a couple of preferences. Is he the little guy you sent me pictures of munching on, gnawing on the bone that was almost as big as him? Yes. And oh do you not know God, why? It was the cutest thing ever. I'm going to, I'm going to put those pictures. You will be able to see those pictures on the Hound Healer page of the Pet Life Radio site because Blueberry is just the cutest little guy ever. And that bone, he is really going to town and it's really cute. It's really funny. So two things on that. One thing is, He's 14. He's over 14. And he might be starting to get into senior land. I still don't really <laughs> I love that. Him. Yes. That's yeah. Really you know, he might be dipping a paw in, you know, we'll see. <laughs> and the other thing about that is the reason that I get, that I feed him these mammoth raw meaty bones is because He's a choking hazard. When he stresses out, he gulps and I want to be safe. Yes. I learned from Casey, you cannot choke on something the size of your own head. Yes. Or bigger. Yes. So he will get the meat off that. He won't, at this point in his stage, he can't take down those bones. He used to be able to, no problem. But at this stage, he can't, but he'll still eat a lot of the flesh and he'll gnaw on those bones, which will give him exercise and clean his little tiny teeth. And massage his gums. And massage his gums. And let him participate in the happiness protocol, being super That's happy. Right. <laughs> I like to say that when he comes out of the crate after eating uh, one of those mammoth raw meaty bones, he's usually in there like an hour or so. He comes out <laughs> looking like he smoked a cigarette. That is one <laughs> happy dude. That's adorable. Very cute. Okay, let's move on to another miss. Most people that I come into contact with feed their dogs 
twice a day. You Mm -hmm. do not talk about that. Once they're adults, I do not. So I have a puppy and she is uh, like four months old. So it's still appropriate for her to have three or four meals a day. So I give her three or four meals a day, which all add up to the same amount of food that she'll eat in one meal when she's an adult. Got you. Yes. And because remember, when puppies are in the wild, they're going to go and suckle and mom is going to bring home food and everything's going to be a bit piecemeal. Let's put a pin in piecemeal because that's critical, right? So they're going to get a few meals a day because they're nursing and waiting for for uh, prey or you know kill from from mom, um, and so that's appropriate. Then once they become a year old or a little over a year, year and a half depends on the dog. I switch it up and they get one meal a day, all of it, all in one meal, and that's it. So I do that in the late afternoon, early evening. And here's a big tip. Never do it the same time every day or you will create the worst beggars ever. So explain to my listeners why you feed one meal a day. Because that closer replicates what they would do in nature. They would most likely only get one meal a day if they got a meal. So let's just do that. And I do it in the afternoon, early evening, because that coordinates with their circadian rhythms and their bodies know what to do with that. So I'm like, anything I can do to honor who they were before humans tried to make them who they wanted to be. Beautiful. And I want to talk a little bit about the circadian rhythms because there may be pet parents listening who don't really understand what that means and why it's important to feed in alignment with uh, circadian rhythms and how the body works. So talk a little bit about that. I don't know a ton about it. I know that we have, we have a circadian rhythms. They have their circadian rhythms. It just basically is what they would do if they were left to their own devices and we didn't interfere and the times a day that they would do the things that they should do as dogs. So right now in the wild, they'd probably be all sleeping. So all three of mine crashed out. Even my hyper, totally excited four month old puppy is over there sprawled. Yeah. Nice. That's great. Well, from a four month old puppy, you want them to rest as much as they can because they're all over the place. Right. And that's the other thing I love is again, when you feed, you exercise while you're feeding. So, and it's also exercising the brain. They have to try and figure out, can I eat this? How can I eat this? Is it best to pull over here? Is this bone something really I can eat and consume? Or is it something I want to clean and not consume? And their little doggy brains are doing all kinds of stuff, which in the training world, they call in enrichment. Yes. So they're both getting a meal, getting exercise and getting enrichment. Yes. And that is why my dog is calm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And also we had talked about when you change it up, their feeding time, uh, you don't make it the same time every day. It's yeah. also a way to avoid that stomach growling because their bodies are in, in anticipation. They just know when it's feed time, if it's the same time every day, right? Dogs are way better about time than I am. And so (laughs) when, if you feed at four o'clock every day at about three o'clock, your dogs are going to go, uh, something's coming. Can we have it early? Can we have it? How about now? How about now? How about now? Right. And, um, and so when you switch it up, which by the way, my dogs are 12 and 14, my older two. And I just started doing that a month or two ago. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting because their bodies respond to their minds. Their bodies and minds are as connected as ours is. And, and so, yeah, the stomach juices start, you know, that's what happens when they're on a really regular schedule, their body goes, we're supposed to eat in an hour and their stomachs go, let's get ready for this. And it starts releasing the juice. And that's why a lot of dogs get that spit up the bile and don't feel very well. Yep. I've had that with my Sophie. You know, if I try to fast her for more than half a day, that's exactly where she would go. It's like her body mind connection just created a real upset in her gut. Yes. So when you're transitioning and doing that transition, you can try a hard fast, which I'm a fan of, just water. But if that's just too much, give them just a tiny bit, just just a morsel. Yeah. And then start phasing that out. It satisfies. Exactly. All right. Wonderful. This is great. 
This is great, Cabernet. So how do you make feeding well, feeding good food, easy, affordable, and not too time consuming? Give us your best tip. The first thing we need to address is raw meaty bones. Good. That's a huge part. Raw meaty bones can be fed up to 60% of their diet. And because I don't want to do complicated math, I eyeball and go, let's do around 50%. Most people can figure out 50%, even me. So that's a really easy way of doing that. And the other myth is when their poop comes out white, you're feeding too much bone. No, you're feeding bone. It comes out white. It's fine. So let's talk about how to safely, what a raw meaty bone is and how Mm -hmm. to introduce it safely. So on a small animal, a raw meaty bone is any bone in cut. Any bone in cut qualifies. And it's really nice. Explain in cut. Yes. And it really helps if they are a younger animal. That's also good too, because the bones are a little softer. So a bone in cut is any part of the animal that has meat on some bone. How easy is that? It's a raw meaty bone. Let's not complicate it. So a chicken wing, a duck neck, heads count. So you can do a duck head, a rabbit head, a rabbit leg. If it's a very small animal, like a quail, and you have a, you know, like a 60 pound dog, um, I'll let somebody else do the math and get that to metric, but they can eat a whole quail. Just give them the quail. Not a problem. Cornish game hen, fine. You have a couple of dogs and they're like 70 pounds, 80 pounds. Get a well-raised chicken. Don't get a commercial raised chicken because they aren't going to be as nutritious. So spend a little bit more money and get the pasture raised if you can get it. Take that chicken, cut it in half. One goes to Fido and one goes to Fluffy and call it a day. You're done. And the beautiful, and then split the organs up between them. Great. That's a beautiful way of feeding. So that is a raw meaty bone. In a large animal, like a buffalo or a deer or a cow. Cow was probably the most popular one, right? Or unless you're in India, then not so popular for that reason. And a pig, large hog, everything along the top line is fair game. So head, neck, ribs, tails, those are all beautiful. Those are all fine because they're not weight bearing. So in these animals, especially like these thousands of pounds animals, you know, like a bovine, those weight bearing bones are too dense. So a couple of things can happen with those dense bones. If you have a really intense dog, my first dog, Border Collie Mix, she was really wired tightly and she really wanted to win. So if they go for this, they could crack their tooth because that bone is denser than their tooth. The other thing is they're not going to really be able to get through it, fully consume it. They're not going to be able to do that. So they're not going to get all the great calcium and other minerals that are from there. So if you have a raw meaty bone that say one of those I talked about along the top line of a large animal or any part bone in from a smaller animal, and they eat the muscle meat and the sinew and the tendons and the bone, and they will, I trust me, fully consume that bone. That is a perfect calcium phosphorus ratio. And the whole thing is when you go to commercial pet food, They are trying to artificially do this. So they're using mineral supplements to try to replicate this perfect, given to us by nature everywhere we look, calcium phosphorus ratio. And when you use bone and muscle, it's fully consumable. It is bioavailable. It's what they're supposed to eat. Their bodies go, yeah, we know what to do with that. We know exactly how to make all the things we need to make from that. But if you give them... The supplements of calcium, what is it? Calcium citrate? Citrate. Citrate, Yeah. And the phosphorus. And and it's got to be balanced like a chemist. And it's not bioavailable. And it's also going to leach some of the calcium and phosphorus that you're trying to feed. Let me stop you right there, though, because I know that there are going to be pet parents listening that are going to say... I either don't have the time or don't have the inclination to want to be chopping up, you know, parts of animals and their organs in my kitchen. Sure. So for those pet parents, I mean, you order from SF Raw. 
I do. So they do some of the work for you, depending on what some you of order. It. Yes. Yes. Well, here's the thing. The less you do, the more that you have the people who are preparing the food for you, the more they do, the more expensive it's going to be. So sometimes there's a lot of reasons people don't want to do that work. And I get it. I totally get it. It's messy. People are worried about the germs. Just clean it like you would anything else. Use some good hot water and dish soap and you'll be just fine. Yeah. But you know, some people don't want to do that. Some people are vegan. Casey is a vegan. And, you know, so it's it's a choice you have to make or not make. So I get that. But you're gonna spend more if they grind everything. You can get ground bone ground in with meat and organ, and you can call that a day, but they're not going to get the exercise and they're not going to get the teeth cleaning. And we all know, I think we do, that good dental health critical. is critical. critical. It's, one of the first, it's one of the first, like they say, the, the eyes are the window into the soul and the teeth is the window into our body. So oh, we yeah. can heart disease the- and all sorts of other things from- yes. a- a poorly managed mouth. But also, Cabernet, it's true that a lot of these places like a Raw Feeding Miami or an SF Raw, really wonderful places that when they do a grind, meaning the muscle meat with the organ meat with the bones, the bones usually are only representing about 10%, maybe 15% of the grind. So there's nothing wrong with feeding a grind and then supplementing it with actual raw meaty bones, like, you know, three times a week or four times a week or whatever. Absolutely. How clean do you want that mouth? That's my question. If you want that <laughs> mouth as sparkly as we can make it, give them a raw meaty bone every day. If you're not as inclined, do it less. And yes, the ground in bone that will take care of a lot of the nutritional needs. And that's great. Uh, but yes, I'm a fan of, and I do sometimes get a grind that has bone in. It's the whole animal just ground up. And I put it in Kongs. So, and I freeze it if, if the dog is, uh, can handle that and to make it a harder job and more enrichment, but it doesn't clean their teeth, but it does no, do a lot exactly. of Exactly. Raw meaty bones are critical, but for pet parents that are willing to spend a little bit more to have a grind, they can supplement that grind with actual raw meaty bones so that they can can have their their animal get the exercise the pleasure and the nutritional benefits the dental benefits that it brings yeah yes and and so we've got a couple things about raw meaty bones we have to cover and one is some dogs you know, it, it, it can be a choking hazard. You know how a toddler has to learn how to eat. Mm-hmm. Some dogs have to learn how to eat safely. Mm-hmm. And so I always say, hopefully you'll never have to use it, but do go up and Google or whatever search engine you like, the Heimlich maneuver. Google the Heimlich maneuver and and just uh, four dogs, yep. just so you know. And sometimes yep. you've got to intercede and also don't leave them unattended Attended. with a raw meaty bone. So we want them safe. I already discussed how when they are gulpers to make sure that they're larger raw meaty bone. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about gulpers is do if you're going on vacation or having people over with their dog or something that is going to stress your dog out, just give them the ground in bone. Just, Just do that that day. Because when they stress out, then they're more apt to gulp. And we want everyone very safe. Yeah. Plus things like raw meaty bones can be a source of friction between animals, especially animals that don't live together normally. Yeah. And I make sure that everybody is sequestered when I feed because some dogs are more exciting and interesting than other dogs. And, you know, and because the raw meaty bone is is high value for most dogs. But going back to uh, one step, I know that there are butchers, like if you find some good chickens, you can ask them to cut it up five ways. And then you don't have to do much. And that's easy. Things like that. Um, when you're cutting it yourself, if you're so inclined and want to try that and haven't done it, make sure that you, I hate saying this for the people who are vegans and very sensitive. I love all the animals. I'm just feeding my dog. You're going to dislocate that joint and then use some poultry shears to go between the joint. So you don't have any rough edges that could tear on some tissue. So that is my other tip to be safe feeding those raw meaty bones. 
Perfect. So what have you found to be the best form of probiotics for your animals and why? I always go to nature. So green tripe, remember that all of that food that they're eating has to go there and, and it's green. They eat grass, most of those ruminants, grass and herbs, and it has to go into their stomachs and it gets fermented just that's nature's way. So now it is pulverized and fermented. So that is a wonderful way to, uh, to address that. And the other thing I love is goat, raw goat kefir. It is easy to make. If you, um, you can look it up. It's very simple. You just get the grains, you mix them with the, with the raw milk, you leave it out on your counter and ignore it for a day to three days until it's thick and you, you strain it and you have kefir and you can keep those grains and reuse them and um and make more so it's really easy it's it heals the gut it's amazing stuff so that is and and you know i'm not opposed to some raw cow milk kefir as well but goat is definitely a better match for for them yeah and there are so many vitamins and minerals in there and the probiotic spectrum is brilliant so yeah i i use it a lot and people forget that milk raw milk from the teat is what these animals are sustained upon for the first however many weeks, months, depending on the animal of their life. So you're giving a complete food. I don't like to say complete and balanced because it's, we do that over time, but that is it that has everything they need for, you know, so if somebody has some issues, depending on what they are, you can do a kefir fast and know that your dog is getting their nutrition just fine. Exactly. Beautiful. The last thing, because we do have to wrap up, unfortunately, but the last thing that I want to talk with you about briefly is the importance of varying your proteins. Yes. Okay. Very so I'm gonna important. Start, I'm going to start with, yes. Yeah, so this is how we are going to get all the things that the body needs and thrives on. So every meat, every animal, everything has its own unique makeup of minerals and vitamins and all of that. So when you have a varied diet, and I like a minimum of seven proteins, so that's seven different animals we're going to feed these puppies. Not all in one meal, don't worry. (laughs) Doesn't have to be one meal. Um, I have somebody who's switching right now and she's going away for Christmas. And I said, hey, you can just feed just some really good pasture-raised ground beef that day. And then the next day, you can put, you can do some eggs and some kefir. Done, you know. And and then and then maybe the next day when you give some, these are small dogs, when you give some uh some ground beef, maybe a little spoonful of some organs. So the basic pie, let's think about the pie, half raw meaty bones. Now, if they're really bony, you do a little more meat. If they're not as bony, you don't have to do as much meat. Half raw meaty bones. You can feed up to 30% green tripe. So I like about 25% green tripe. You have to do 10 to 15% organ. It is essential. It's just a powerhouse. That's what, you know, supplements, what? Organs. That is really, really the best supplement nature wants to give you. Yeah. That's liver. That's heart. That's spleen. That's gallbladder. That's gizzards in, in some poultry. Um, Absolutely. So that's that. And then you have a little bit of extra that you can do kefir, eggs, fish. So very quickly, fish, uh, especially not all fish, actually. Salmon, Salmon. which should be wild. Don't feed the farm stuff. It's oh God, no. Good for you. no. Wild salmon and pork and game. If somebody goes hunting and, and gifts you, those need to be frozen for three weeks. And then you can feed them and feel great about it. Because of any kind of parasites. Because the parasites parasites don't hold up in the um, freezer. freezer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. This has been amazing, Cabernet. You've given some wonderful information to pet parents. And I'm really thrilled that you were on the show. The biggest takeaway to me seems obvious, but it's go back to nature, right? Yes. Go back to nature and you don't always catch a cow. That's right. That's right. So vary it up. Some days it's a rabbit. Some days it's a cow. Some days it's a duck. Some days it's a chicken. And it doesn't have to be every day something different. You can feed something straight for two weeks and then switch up. That's fine. I did that for years. It's okay. If you're feeding whole food that's from nature for an animal that is has developed over the millennia to eat that food, you have a lot more wiggle room. 
Yeah. And make it fun. Make it fun. It doesn't have to be a chore. This could be something that is made with love because you know that you're giving your animal something that is going to create optimal health in their body. So make it fun and and do it with love. Um, Thank you so much, Cabernet. It's been great having you on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you all for listening. As a health coach, my mission is to share holistic healing options for pets and their parents seeking a natural approach to wellness. So tune in next time for information, expert interviews, and tips to give the animals we so love the longest and most vibrant life we can. I'm Jody Teich, and this is The Hound Healer. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.